welcome to Success Redefined with Dr. Tony Warner. I'm Dr. Tony, mama five, psychotherapist, author, and mentor. Here, you're going to find insightful discussions spanning science, psychology, and soul as the personal and professional meet, and we explore the intersection of what really matters. So success can be redefined with connection, healing, and fulfillment in mind. In today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Heather Brown, a clinical psychotherapist, mother, and widow, to have a raw conversation about how we've redefined success after loss while we're navigating grief, things like mental health, big topics, right? Like mental health and parenting and widowhood are woven in this conversation in such a vital way. I even find myself actually getting teary-eyed at certain parts of our conversation today. So I'm glad you're here. As a relationship expert, Dr. Heather Brown has worked with thousands of individuals and couples in psychotherapy. She's a TEDx and keynote speaker. Uh, She's published hundreds of journals. She's active on TikTok. If you want to hop on TikTok and follow her channel there, she's been featured on news stations such as ABC7 and so on and so forth. She's even been published in a variety of magazines like Thriving Family Magazine, Light in Life, Brains, Scary Mommy, Psychology Today. She is a regular guest blogger for the Links for Shrinks and for Marriage Family Therapist. She's also someone who values motherhood and has deeply personal experiences with the topics that we're going to chat about today. Let's go ahead and get started. And welcome, everyone. We have a very special guest to I found through, I don't know if you know this actually, Dr. Heather, but I saw you first through our mutual friend, Sherry, who will also be on a later episode of this podcast. And anyone who is a friend of Sherry Elise's, I know has a genuine authentic heart. And then I saw you shared some of your posts and saw that you're also a therapist like myself. I said, I need to reach out to her. I need to speak to her. So I am happy. I am thankful that you are here with us today, Dr. Heather Brown. Thank you for coming and saying yes to being with us. Absolutely. I'm honored. And as you know, being a therapist, it takes it to just a really beautiful place to speak with another therapist um, in this fashion. and. I love Sherry. She's she's just a light to this world. Yeah, she is. I agree. I, and I, I do find that there's something interesting in having a conversation, especially the one we're going to have today, with a fellow therapist. Because even within the therapist community, there are these different areas, different niches, different beliefs, different ways of functioning and and things like that. So when you get to connect with another therapist who you have a sense that you align with in many ways, there's a lot of, I don't know, excitement that (laughs) that can come with that. And just all my curiosities and my philosophical desires, all those things come out. And so you might feel a little bit of that here today. But it's always an honor when a therapist comes and wants to work with me, like I'm coming with you. That's such a deep, respectful place because it is such a sacred role that you and I have stepped into and been called into. And so I really honor that. So thank you for, for wanting me here. I'm really excited to see how we can support your listeners. Okay. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to dive in to redefining success, and maybe it's going to be mostly focused on relational success after someone has experienced loss while navigating grief. And we say grief and loss, I would say for the earlier years in my personal life and my professional life, I I kind of conflated them together, um, but I don't anymore because there's a distinction for me. There's a connection, of course, but there's also a distinction. And so before I dive into some of that conversation, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit on whether or not you see a distinction between the two and if so, what, what that might be with grief and loss. 
I do. Absolutely. Grief to me is the experience and the process that you're going through following the loss. Mm -hmm. Emotional experience. It's it's the, the transformation that happens. It's the letting go and the ache of that letting go and then finding who you are now and how to carry forth without this person, this job, this pet, whatever it is that you might a limb, whatever it is you might be grieving from. So to me, grieving is the emotional state of the journey that you're going through. Loss is what you have experienced. And so that's more so the action, if you will. And the grief is the heart and the soul and the pain of what you go through when your life changes drastically because it's altered in a way that you didn't want to have happen. Would you say it's fair to, if we were to put it in super simple terms of loss is the external situation and grief is their internal experience of that? Yes. If we yes. just if we were to put it super simple, of course, there's you know more nuances there, but does that fit your description? I think it does. I think it does. Though for me, when I think of grief, grief kind of encapsulates everything mm. in, in, into the external as well. I remember when my husband died feeling like the hairs on my body were standing on end and alert. My whole body just felt like, ah. Mm. Oh. And so it, it felt like all of me was in that process. Whereas when I thought of loss, you think more so of what has happened. Grieving is, that to me would be more so it. Loss is what has happened. Mm -hmm. Grieving is the way you experience what has happened. Mm -hmm. And so that internal process of that fact. And when we look at grief and loss in that way, would you say, is it fair to say that grief and loss affects all of us? At some point in life, grief and loss affects all of us, whether we're super aware of it or not. Like it just, it's inherent. It's an inherent part of life. Every day. I mean, we don't think about it, but you see a leaf on the ground. Mm. You see a worm. Now, they're not that important to you, so... It, you don't have an emotional reaction to them. But it's, it's odd to me that in this world that is so much about life and transitions, that we celebrate life and we're excited about life. And then we think no one should ever die. And everyone is going to. Death is as natural as birth. But because we don't want it to happen, we feel we've been robbed, cheated. Some, you know, we're resentful of what has happened. But death happens all the time. You know, our bodies are constantly changing. It's just that for most of us, we don't go through a massive, massive loss mm. that many times. Unless you have a huge family. I have a client whose family was like 50 people. So in one year, she lost 15. Wow. Yeah. And we have a lot of work to do to keep her solid in that process. But I also, shared with her, well, my family's three, so I haven't had 50 birthdays and 50 births and 50 celebrations. I've had three. So do you go through much more grieving than I do in that, in that sense? Are there more deaths? Yes. But there are also so many more celebrations and experiences. So there's a balance to it. And it's really hard when you love someone and you love having them in your life. You don't want them to go. Yeah. And it's hard. I love that you, you started out that conversation saying life and transitions because we do you know, our human brains love to put things in black or white, all or nothing, you know, you know, put, put them in these, these rigid separate boxes like life and death. Right. But when you use the word transition, it encompasses death, but it encompasses so much more. So for me, I have four children and I'm pregnant with my fifth and my oldest is, um, a teenager now. And I think it, it's easy for some people to understand if I share 
about losses of miscarriages that I've had, right? Like in between. But for some people, I think it's harder to understand. And I can even get teary. I just talking about it. The grief I feel in my daughter being a teenager and how there's this, like, she's not my little girl anymore, but she is. But like, she's different because she's growing and she's turning into her own person. But the way that she talks and behaves is just so there's some of it aligns so much with the way I raised her and some of it pushes right up against it. And I know developmentally that that is exactly where she's supposed to be, right? Like I, I know that is exactly where she's supposed to be, but it's a transition and the transition, the adjustment of watching my first baby, right? Transition into adulthood through adolescence there's grief there, right? That that I experience on a regular basis. And that's the kind of transition I think that is harder for us to understand because it's it's a it's happens in the gray. It's not all this black and white. And I I want to feel we talk on this show about redefining success, right? So I want to feel that I am navigating that grief as her mom in a way that feels successful to me, right? Like meaningfully successful to me. And so I know that everyone experiences different transitions, different losses. And I want to share, I just wanted to share a little bit about mine there so that people can can see and hear wherever they're at, whether they've had um, a death in, in their family or their intimate group, or whether it's a different experience, a different kind of transition, right? That comes with this grief process that we're talking about all of it, right? Like we're, we're, we don't want to minimize any of it. Does that COVID make- was a grief process. In COVID, we lost socialization. We lost being able to go and have our freedom. And so I don't know for you, but I had some people who really struggled, extroverts, the entertainers, the athletes, who they were, they now couldn't be. Mm-hmm. And so much of who they were was that interaction with their audience or, or with their fans. And that, that was something to grieve for a period of time. You talk about something that is, is is just so tender and so beautiful, which is when you love someone and you've loved this experience, this time, and then they move beyond or you move beyond, that part of your heart will always be there. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing and it's a painful thing to be able to say, I so loved this journey with you. And I honor that you are now adulting and stepping out into the world. But I also miss when you were five. Yeah. And I think for me, that place of looking at it as, well, what is the success in this transition? To me, would be more so, how much are you allowing yourself to experience what you are feeling in this transit transition? And when you open yourself up to that, I believe you find what you are to find. Both of my children moved out of the home within two weeks. <laughs> and this was four years after my husband had passed. Wow. And I thought, great. Like they're, they're going to go off and do college in the military and life. And, is, and isn't that fantastic? I've done what I am to do. And, and I remember um, I have a very close relationship with God. So I remember reaching out to God and I said, what, what am I going to do? And he said, capture joy. And I said, well, I thought that was for you to instill <laughs> in me. And he said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and you are going to need to capture joy. And I said, okay, how do I do, how do, I do that, God? And he said, in every possible moment, in every possible way. And I thought, oh, damn. But he was absolutely right. And I remember being devastated the night 
before my son went to boot camp. Right. The three of them on her bed, sobbing, crying. In the morning, sobbing, crying. Having him go. And then finally we got to go to, it was just a couple of days later, his initiation. And I thought I was going to be a complete mess because that's the time he's going off for, for the eight weeks. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And, and Max said, like, Mom, please, like, you, you got to kind of be able to, to contain yourself. I don't fall apart often, but like, this was my baby. And I said, yeah, I will. I will. So when we went, it was, a, it, it was so beautiful. We went. He was sworn in. They said, like, you've given away your child, you know, for the next eight years. And as we had five minutes for, for Sienna and I to have time with Mac before he left. And all these people kept coming up to him and saying, Brown, where do we put the form? Brown, where do we do that? And I'm like getting a little antsy. of like, people, you're taking my time, taking my time. <laughs> and then I had this beautiful washing over of me. And he looked at me and he said, you're good. And I'm like, I am so good. Yeah. He said, mom, really? I'm like, you are already doing what you're called to do. Yeah. Mac, this isn't about me. It's about yep. you. Huge shift. Didn't sob all the drive home. I mean, I had my moments, of course, where I missed him dearly and I cried, but it shifted it. And, and I'm not saying that you ever want to negate your own experience. You don't. You need to do all those feels to make certain that you're congruent. But there's also a place when it's a transition where the person's moving into a different experience. To also take a moment and look at where they're going Absolutely. and who they are and what they're doing. And they will be taking you with them because you help them, especially with your babes, to get to that moment. And when you can sit back and kind of go, oh, wow. you then get to step into a different relationship with them. You're still going to miss five. You're always going to miss five. And three. But it's a really incredible thing to be invited in to your becoming adult children's lives in ways where it's not solely mom. Mm -hmm. And interesting possibilities come out of that. My daughter and I create together. It's wonderful. It is. And it comes out of that place of me respecting who she is, what she does, how she is. And at times they're saying, I need some of that mama love in this. I'm like, I'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring it. And then we, we play once again. And she's, she's 26, five-year-old. You know, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a 60-year-old, 35-year-old or whatever it was we were at that age. So let yourself be in what it is and you, you will get the answers of what it is you are to find. Yeah, I, I, I believe that there's so much opportunity to honor and to appreciate both the past and the future, even when we're, I think, grounded in the present, right? 100%. And um, that's, that's one of those things that as I navigate the, the grief experience of just children growing as they are intended to grow. Uh, you did a good job. I, yes, that I and remember. Job when they leave about. the nest. Yes, we need to remind ourselves of that. But you said something <clears throat> that might be hard for, I think, a lot of people to understand or to integrate if they are currently going through a grief process. Um, and that is to capture joy. You, you, you shared and that you shared elsewhere in, in other speeches and things like that, that you have done um, about some of your own personal experience with grief and loss. And they're very deeply personal. Uh, one is related to your husband and one is related to your mother. And so I know that you have personal and professional, but but this deep personal experience with navigating grief and loss. And then you go and you share about joy, right? And it's like, what for so many people, that can feel so confusing and almost like, wait, but that's not being like, I, that doesn't feel like success for me because aren't there's guilt 
there's anger, there's all of these strong emotions that can come up when someone's navigating grief and loss. So I'm curious, can you share a little bit about your own grief and loss journey and kind of where it was initially? And then we'll come back later to where you are with it now and and even what's helped you capture joy in that. But so our listeners can get an idea of how deeply meaningful this topic and this conversation really is for you. So my mom killed herself when I was 16. Um, I don't know if I came into this world to be here to keep her alive or if that's a role I put upon myself. But from the earliest I can remember, I tried to give my mom reasons to be here. She was a paranoid schizophrenic. And um, it was it was hard. It was a hard journey because her psychoses were hurtful and cruel and, and painful oftentimes. Um, and I had to weather that and go through that. It took a long time after she died for me to be able to really find who I was because my childhood was really spent or I chose for in my childhood to be spent on like how is mom doing so it was lots of people pleasing lots of checking in anyone who's who's lived with someone who has a violent temper or has addictive problems or has mental instability knows what I'm talking about you open the door and I'd say like hey mom and then depending what room she was in would depend how the night was going to go. It was, it was really hard. The flip was when she was here, like she could be amazing and beautiful and creative and, and wonderful. But having lost her at a really young age and then being on my own at 17, relationship, partnership was so important Mm. and the reason i'm a psychotherapist is because of my mom um she when i was a child there really weren't resources not that she would have gotten them anyway because with the paranoid schizophrenic they don't trust so it's very hard for them to get medical care but we as a family didn't didn't have any and Mm -hmm. so Everything was just kind of ripped apart. And on our own, we tried to figure out how to put the pieces back together. Um, met my husband, fell madly in love, had two beautiful children. Um, he died suddenly of a heart attack. And then I was once again, you know, on my own and, and needing to raise two young children who were, who were hurting really deeply, really, really deeply. Um, When I say that it's important to find joy, there's a lot of levels to joy. Mm. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, huge smile and laughter. But I remember looking at, it was in the middle of COVID and I had lost my social life. I couldn't see my children because they both were in places where they weren't allowed to be around other people because of quarantine. And so it was me in my house by myself and I was sinking. I was grieving the loss of people. And I went on a three hour bike ride just to exhaust myself, came back home, laid on the grass, didn't want to go in the house. And I remember looking at the bottom of a rose and it was beautiful. And I'd ever looked at the bottom of the rose before. And it distracted me. So I went and looked at it and I took a picture of it. And then I looked at all the roses bottles in my garden. And I FaceTimed my daughter and said, have you ever looked at the bottom of a rose? Look. And I showed her all these roses and she literally said to me, you're having such a beautiful day. 
part of me wanted to say, oh, no, it's been hell and I am terrible and all I want to do today is die. But the other part of me thought, I'm not feeling that darkness right now. Mm. So to me, if you go on the spectrum of I've got to be here or at least I'm choosing to be here. How can I veer this? I woke up one day dark. I don't have many dark days anymore. Thank you, God. But I woke up one day dark and I remember laying in my bed thinking, like, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And I was crying and I was holding myself thinking, like, I just, I don't, I don't. But I knew I needed to somehow shift. So I closed my eyes and just sat in my bed crying. And I thought, what can I be grateful for? And I said, I have a bed. I have a bed. I have a bed. Thank you for my bed. Thank you for my bed. Then I said, thank you that my bed is soft. And then I went to, thank you that I have this warm comforter that feels really good over my legs. Thank you for that I have a bed that's soft, that I have a warm comforter. And then I heard a bird. And so I said, oh, comforter. And then I heard, thank you that I have ear that I could hear the bird. And then I opened my eyes and I went, oh, thank you that I have eyes. And then I have a window. And then I saw the bird fly by. And then there were wind chimes. It's like if you open up a photo album of someone that you love who has died. It can be glorious. And it can be devastating. And when you find you're moving into devastating, there's a place to ask yourself, is there more down there I need to retrieve? Or is this just painful? And if the answer is, this is just painful, heavy, and painful, there's nothing more I need to learn, close the photo album. Mm. And then let your eyes veer just a little bit. A little nudge to, oh, there's a rose is a different feeling. Oh, there's a bird is a different feeling. When we're really in the depth of grief, there's a little place to recognize life is going on. And a lot of us is resentful that that's happening because it feels like our life has stopped. Our life is transitioning. We are still here. There is more for us to find. It is 100% going to take a while and it's going to really hurt. And it can be really scary. I remember feeling completely naked in the world. I remember walking around thinking, like, people must be seeing, like, all of me. Because without Tad, my late husband, I felt different in the world. Mm. Being connected to my husband made me feel I was going through life with someone else. Because I was. Mm. And then when I died, all of a sudden it was just me. Raising my kids on my own. I don't have a large family. So it just felt naked. And I remember I couldn't even make eye contact with people I didn't recognize. And I was at the gym one day and there was this horrible earthquake. And I happened to see it on the news. And I looked up and I went, Dear God, Heather, look up. Look up. People are dying in an earthquake and you're unaware. Mm. And then to realize that I needed to lift myself out a little bit of my cocoon and start to involve myself more so with the external world. I was doing okay with my little world, but I wasn't looking mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. I think it's common when you're mm -hmm. grieving because, like, I don't go out to dinner on Valentine's Day. Like, that would not be a good idea for me to, to do. I don't. I mean, I'm so happy for everyone to be in love and, ugh. Then I go like, my God, it's been nine years. Like I miss, I miss being loved. So like there's ways that you got to protect yourself where it feels too hard. And if you take that view, I'm going to protect myself through my grief. Mm -hmm. There's a different energy that comes in because all of a sudden it's not all ripped apart, destroyed out there in the open naked. There's a place of 
oh, dear God, I am hurting so badly. Like, I've got to protect me. Who do I let in and how do I let in? How do I tell myself, like, I just need to stay home and, like, hermit today and let today go by? There's a lot of days that we just let go by because they were, they were, it was just too hard. Mm. So there's a lot of layers to grief. There are and, a lot of layers to, to grief and, and to all of our emotions, right? But what, what would you say as you share your story or experience with us, what would you say helped you navigate the loneliness within that grief? The loneliness that was accompanying, that was kind of latching onto that grief. What helped you navigate that in, in a way that felt most healthy and helpful as you look back? Well, and I don't know for your listeners where people are spiritually. So I, I do need to say this is just my experience and, mm. and, and, and my way of doing life because everyone needs to no. honor For me, it was that. It, it was my, it was my, it was my spiritual connection. It was, I am to be here. And I am to be here sharing my grief. Mm. And to be here to help others who are going through something very similar. And, and the more I leaned into that, I used to, I used to wail sitting on the toilet seat from three to six in the morning. The kids and I, we were all falling apart, but I needed them to not see me in that like tragic creek, you know, and, and, and I was there. I was for sure there. So from three to six, I would wail on the toilet. And I remember knowing that I needed to do that and be with God because he was going to get me through. I was going to get through however that looked. And I remember one morning, it was like 4.15, and someone was praying for me. And I felt it. I hadn't felt it like that until that morning. I remember posting on Facebook, whoever it was a couple weeks out, Whoever was praying for me at 4.15 this morning, I felt it. Wow. And one of my friends said, it was me. There was a shift in that because it took me, it took me a little bit out of Heather view and realized, oh my gosh, like people tell you they're praying. And, and you know the people in your family and your friends want the best for you. But I felt those prayers. And then what happened is I just welcomed in comfort in whatever way it wanted to come. I'm a writer. I'm a poet. So poetry started to come. Mm. And feeling of, and I hope this doesn't sound too out there, but um, the expression of Mother Mary's love came. And I felt her holding me when I'd wake up in the morning. I just felt her arms around me and I would just cuddle up into them because it, it felt so good. Like little little Heather and big Heather just needed love. And so I just felt her wrapped around and I would just, you know, I would just hold and I started to develop a deeper and deeper connection with spirit, with God, with Mother Mary, with the earth. I started just to become so grateful that I, I have this life whether it's in pain at this moment or whether it's not, that I get to be Heather. Like, I'm the only Heather there's ever going to be. And yeah. I started to look at my life as like, what a beautiful, hard, amazing experience this is. My mom chose to end hers early, which on some of I understand because her life was horrid. But I look at mine and I think, thank God I didn't have that experience. Thank God I was healthy enough to get myself through. And I continue to be healthy enough to get myself through. Mm -hmm. And the place I really lean on is, is this serving me? And sometimes my feelings aren't. 
self-pity, resentment, jealousy. I mean, we all feel them. But I ask myself, like, is this helping me be the person I want to be? And when I come back with no, then I'm like, okay, Heather, then what are you going to do here? And for me, it always goes back to gratefulness. Mm. Gratefulness. Mm. And I'm hearing this theme. You tell me if this resonates with you or not. Of <clears throat> As you navigated the ebbs and the flows, which there are so many, right, of the grief process, what seemed to be really helpful for you rooted within that faith was this allowing yourself to receive and express to mm-hmm. express and receive receive and express and express and receive and i think that so often when we're navigating transitions in life death or other challenges that feel like a loss that we are grieving like i i shared earlier it it can it, it's going to pull up our default defense mechanisms which for me was like armoring up doing it myself keeping it all in holding it all in you know like kind of handling everything on my own I this I can do it protection from an armored and guarded standpoint not protection in the way that you were talking about it and so that doesn't work it's not sustainable it makes it harder eventually right and actually makes it feel lonelier over time but when you gradually practice allowing yourself to express whatever it is you need to express the guilt the anger the frustration the resentment the jealousy like allow yourself safe outlets safe ways to express in writing and praying and whatever that is walking and hiking and whatever that is for you allow that but then also allow yourself to receive receive the support receive as you experienced the prayer receive whatever the the thing or person is that is entering right trying to enter to be of of a of a, a comfort to you that it's not bad or wrong to feel comfort especially after a loss that is death and Wait, so and it's not weird that we feel guilty mm-hmm. i find that and mm-hmm. and i think probably everyone does but you feel like oh i shouldn't be happy and you think, well, gosh, when my mom died, she didn't want me to be sad for the rest of my life and destroyed. So there's that part of us that we need to walk through, which is how beautiful it is that I can feel some joy, some happiness, some pleasure, that I can smell this rose. And at the same time, I know you're missing. Like, I can do both. And I'm not always in one and then never the other. But if we don't allow ourselves, and this is part of the problem of of toxic grief, if we don't allow ourselves to move beyond the death, then we're not celebrating the person's life. Mm. We're celebrating their demise. So I I want to capture that. If we're not allowing ourselves to live beyond the person's death, what was the next part? Then we're celebrating their death and their demise. Mm. That is the most important thing about them. They died instead of what they brought. Mm. I wrote a poem on the 38th anniversary of my mom killing herself. It's called 38 Years of Days. It's published. It's really beautiful. And then on the 40th anniversary, I wanted to write another. And I was saying things like, have I, have I cried as many tears as there were in the 40 days of the flood? And have, have I walked this earth as much as they did through the desert? It was, it was just all too much. And God, he's very cheeky with me, which I love. He said to me, are you kidding me? And I'm like, what? God? He goes, seriously? This is what you're going to do? I'm like, what? He goes, are you going to do this on 50 and 60 and 75 and 80? 
He goes, Heather, you had your mom for 16 years. How about you start celebrating that? And I went, oh, oh, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time I felt sorry for myself that my mom had died. Mm -hmm. I miss her? Hell yeah. But I celebrate who she was and who she continues to be in mm -hmm. my life. This will help. You don't lose. Okay. Uh, open, open your hearts and your minds and your ears a little bit because it's going to be it's going to be a little bit of a rough road to get there. But you don't lose anything. Truly, in death, you've been given everything you've been given up until that moment. You simply don't get beyond. Mm -hmm. And that hurts. Yeah. But if we could recognize that, nothing was necessarily taken away. I wasn't given more. Yeah. And I wanted more. But that wasn't for me to have. Because we are not promised when we come onto this earth that you're going to have a spouse to the day that you die. You're not promised that every child that you become pregnant with is going to even make it out to the world. We're not promised these things. So if we can free that a little bit and recognize that when we wake up each day, we have this life. That's it. There are no other guarantees. You woke up, there's your guarantee. That's it. That's it. Everything beyond that is either what God brings into your life, others bring into your life, or you choose for yourself. But there is no promise of tomorrow. And there is no promise of what tomorrow will look like. So if you open up your eyes in the morning and say to yourself, oh, I have a day. I have a day. I have another day. What will I do with this? What will I experience with this? Shortly after Ted died, I got a message and it was, I have not so much as taken away from you. I have moved you. You're no longer there. You're here and I am with you. Took it mm -hmm. to my pastor. Like, this is super important. What does this mean? And he's like, ah, I don't know, Heather. I got it. Took me six months. He hadn't so much as taken away. He mm -hmm. put Ted on my for 24 years, every single day, 24 years of Ted, 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 Ted. One moment. August 23rd, 10, 10 in the morning. One moment. One. Not even a minute, a second. Mm. And then he wasn't there. Horrific day. Horrific day. He just was never brought again. So I went through. I have, no, I have not so much as taken away. I've moved you. You are here and I'm with you. I'm like, I know, God, I know, I know. He's like, nope, you don't. That's when I got the awareness. I wake up. I have today. Because I choose to. I invite God into it. And anyone he places on my plate is a gift. Anyone he chooses to take away. I'm going to experience it. But and my belief is what do I do with the sacred journey of today? And when you go there, joy must come through on some level because you are speaking into the fact that you are here post loss. And it becomes critical to be able to find some engagement other than the loss mm -hmm. so bottom of a rose or somebody holding your hand or noticing that there is a sunrise there has to be some kind of at some point a connection to to purpose and Hun connection to something that makes right here right now feel meaningful to me 100%. To you, whatever that is, right? And and that can be different yep. for each of us. And I think 
It might take a while. I remember putting out food for the kids for a couple of days just because it's what a mother does. And we'd we'd sit there and they're like, can I get up now? I'm like, yeah, we'd throw it all away. But like I needed to still like do mom, even though we weren't doing it well. And then Mm -hmm. eventually a couple of bites came in. And I remember one day Max said, can you make spaghetti? And I'm like, you're asking for food? And I was like, yes. You know, he probably took one bite, but it's so important for us to feel the pulse of our heart and our soul and the excitement and, and, and the wonder of our mind. And in grief, dear Lord, it, like it's, it's all in the sewer. Hmm. Feeling that depth of pain is also telling you that your body and your heart and your soul knows it is to be other than what this is. And I think that there, as you said, some people will be able, they're in a place in their journey where this is what they need to hear. Other people might be in a place in their journey where they're like, oh, like I, I'm past that. And other people might be at a place in their journey when they're like, ah, right? Like, what are you talking about? You know, and that's okay. The word journey, I think, is really important here is that it's a journey. It's a process. And so as we as we come to a close with this beautiful conversation, Dr. Heather, where you've shared so much of your heart and your wisdom and yourself with us, I want to ask you from in reflection of the life that you've lived and what you've shared today. How would you define, what's your redefined definition for yourself of navigating grief and loss in a way that feels successful to you? Mm. Honoring where I am in this moment and how much that is colored by all the people and experiences that I have had up until this moment and carrying them with, oh, carrying them with me as I bring to them more of the journey that they couldn't be on with me physically. Hmm. I truly feel I am bringing those I love with me in experiential ways because they have made me who I am. Wow. I think that we, I think we could probably talk about these. So the depths of the aspects that you're bringing to the table around this conversation of grief and loss and the complexity and the nuances of all of it i can i can feel it i can feel it in in your heart and and in what you're sharing probably talk about it forever but for for folks that are really resonating with you dr heather who want to they want to follow you they want to connect with you they want to see what you're up to where is the best place for them to go and and connect with you or follow you in some way, you, your work um, in some way, if they would like to do that. Oh, I'd be honored. Or if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions you have too. It'd be my website. And I know that'll be down in the show notes. It's www.drheatherbrowne.com. And it talks about working with me. I have a blog. I have a newsletter. I have a book, which is on couples communication and creating that sacred connection with compassion. That's on my website as well. And the links are there. So I have workshops. I'm all over social media, TikTok, YouTube, all of that. So if you go to my website, that's kind of like the Heather Brown hub. um, And you can reach me in any way. I just, I did a TEDx um, in, in September. So that's on there as well. But yeah, if your listeners have any questions or want to ask something or want to grab any of my freebies or grab my book, I'd, I'd be honored. So you can head over to Dr. Heather Brown, Brown with an E, because I left the E off and she caught me, which is good. It's easy to forget that, right? DrHeatherBrown.com, Brown with an E. You can connect with her through her help there and, and all the various sources. I I feel blessed to be able to have shared this space and this conversation and this energy with you today, Dr. Heather. And I'm so sure that others feel the same. So again, thank you for being with us today. And everyone who's tuning in, thank you 
Thank you for being with us today on these really difficult topics, but these are topics that matter to us all, topics that affect us all. And if we're not talking about them, we feel so alone in them. So thank you for showing up, for tuning in, for being with us here today. And if you want to be a part of this community, go ahead. If you're on YouTube, get down to the comment section, leave your questions, your reflections, your contributions, your comments there so we can continue to cultivate a community here for us to all be able to support each other in a meaningful and connected way. So until next time, much success to each and every one of you in a way that feels deeply meaningful and that's of benefit to you and those around you. Bye, everyone. Links related to this episode can be found in the show notes section. Want to submit questions about success, satisfaction, healing, and relationships, health, or work? You can do that free and anonymous at drtonywarner.com, where you find other resources there as well. Did you benefit from this episode? You can subscribe, like, and share with another to pass it on because anyone can listen on the go with this podcast audio available on all major podcasting platforms.